Xbox Underground. Xbox Underground. Xbox Underground. Xbox Underground. What if I told you a group of teenagers managed to steal $100 million from some of the biggest companies in the world? Epic Games, Valve, Microsoft, and even the US military. None of them were safe. This is the story of the Xbox Underground, a band of young hackers who didn't just play by their own rules, they rewrote them. These weren't just kids, they were prodigies with a singular mission, infiltrate the gaming industry's giants and take whatever they wanted. But their story is more than just heists and hacks. It's a high stakes game of cat and mouse with authorities around the globe. Get ready, because what you're about to see will redefine everything you thought you knew about the world of hacking. Long before the release of the Xbox in 1995, at the age of just three, David Pecora was mastering first-person shooter games on his parents' computer. It was at that time he fell in love with games, and with that love came a fascination for the idea of control he achieved. He lived with his family in Mississauga, a city in Ontario, Canada. In elementary school, he took programming lessons, created simple programs, and was considered to be a natural programmer. His interest in programming only grew from this point onwards. It got to a point where he was on a family trip to a village in Poland. In the village, there was Wi-Fi, so he began learning Visual Basic. The experience of learning without access to the internet sparked his interest in programming even further. By the time he returned, he had been completely hooked on programming. When David finally plunged into the waters of programming, his parents bought him his first Xbox, on which Pakora spent countless hours playing his favorite Halo 3. Over time, he wanted to learn more about the console and managed to find a community of hackers hacking Xbox, bringing the console to their desired level. He met 18-year-old hacker Anthony Clark on a hacker site. The two of them were working on a hacking program that would allow David to add special skills to the main character in Halo 3. After Pakora got his dev kit, he spent several hours each day hacking Halo 3. David's education at school gradually declined, but dev kit programming was his primary and only source of knowledge. Pakora and Clark grew close, talking about music, automobiles, television nearly daily, and other adolescent subjects. Hackers intercept communication between the processor RAM and flash memory chip by reverse engineering the console. Bruce Schneier, a cryptography specialist, dubbed the finding kindergarten security. The Xbox was able to run Linux, homebrew programs, stream music, and simulate other game systems like Nintendo by having Microsoft leave the decryption key for booting the machine in an accessible memory location. All that was required was to reflash the device. David started polishing his cherished Halo as soon as he found out that this was feasible. David learned how to alter the game's mechanics to add digital water to landscapes and turn blue sky into rain by interacting with hacker communities on IRC. The Xbox 360 remained virtually invulnerable until late 2009 when security researchers finally discovered the weakness by attaching a mod chip to a secret set of pins on the motherboard used for quality control, they were able to negate the 360's security. The hack became known as JTAG, short for the Joint Test Action Group, is an industry body that recommended adding such contacts to all printed circuit boards in the mid-1980s. As news of the vulnerability spread, Xbox 360 owners rushed to modify their consoles to provide services that others didn't have. The market formed overnight. With 23 million subscribers on Xbox Live, multiplayer gaming had become much more competitive, and a crowd of gamers whom Pecora dubbed spoiled kids with their parents' credit cards were willing to go to extreme lengths to humiliate their rivals. For Pecora and Clark, there was an opportunity to make money. They hacked the Call of Duty military shooter series to create what they call mod lobbies, places on Xbox Live where Call of Duty players can join altered reality games. With rates up to $100 for half an hour, players with JTAG consoles participated in death matches with superpowers. They could fly, walk on walls, run at lightning speed, or shoot bullets that never missed their target. 
For an additional $50 to $150, Pecora and Clark offered infections. These were abilities that remained with characters even after joining Unblock games. Pecora initially did not want to sell infections. He knew that customers with such a turbocharged system would kill their unfortunate opponents. The situation disgusted him as being contrary to the spirit of the games. However, on good days the money would come up to around $8,000. There were so many customers that he and Clark had to hire employees to cope with the madness. In the excitement of business, Pecora forgot all about his commitment to justice. Another imperceptible step down. Microsoft tried to suppress Call of Duty cheats by launching an automated JTAG console detection system followed by a ban. But Pecora reversed Microsoft's system and found a way to bypass it. He wrote a program that intercepted Xbox Live security requests and sent them to the console area, where they were filled with false data, passing off the hacked console as certified. Pecora enjoyed the benefits of his success. He still lived with his parents, but paid his own tuition when he enrolled at the University of Toronto in the fall of 2010. He and his girlfriend dined at upscale restaurants every night and stayed in $400 a night hotels while traveling to Canadian metal shows. He derived his sense of exultation and strength not from money or the envy of his peers, but from the fact that a mega popular $60 million blockbuster game behaved the way he wanted. Pecora knew that his business was not entirely legal. Numerous copyrights were violated but he interpreted the lack of significant attacks from Microsoft or Call of Duty developer Activision as a sign that the companies were willing to put up with it, just as Bungie put up with his shenanigans in Halo. An American friend going by the handle Game Freak and an Australian hacker called Dylan Wheeler, then 14 years old, succeeded in 2010 by obtaining a list of passwords for the public forums run by Epic Games. Dylan discovered the password of an employee of Epic Games' IT department's personal account. Now that the two hackers were inside the Epic network, they required more help. Dylan, who was acquainted with David from the forums, requested David's assistance in extracting Halo cards from the partner net network, which is partially open, and breaking into the secure closed network that houses the company's sensitive information. Even though these activities are obviously more illegal, David's curiosity won out, and he decided to assist Dylan as long as he complied with some simple guidelines, including not utilizing credit card information or disclosing private information about Epic customers. Owing to the massive quantity of material they discovered, they brought in another hacker from New Jersey, Sanadota Sonic, who downloaded a copy of Gears of War 3 and a ton of confidential data regarding video games made by Epic Games, which he then forwarded to David. David sent his distributor, Justin May, the game, among other acquaintances. A copy of the game surfaced on the forums as a torrent in a matter of days. Following reports of the Gears of War 3 leak, the FBI launched an investigation. Through reviewing emails from Epic Games, the FBI discovered the existence of a hacking organization. The corporation didn't seem to be trying to stop the hackers though, since the FBI was unable to locate the hackers, and the company couldn't seem to figure out how the hacker gang gained access. As a result, the inquiry eventually came to an end. A tunnel between Zombie Studios and a US Army computer was discovered by a hacking collective. They found a simulator of the AH-64D Apache helicopter on the server which the Zombie Studio was working on under a Pentagon contract. Additionally, they were able to obtain papers for an early Durango version of the Xbox One, the next generation console from Microsoft servers. Although they did not sell the papers to a rival company of Microsoft, they were able to find buyers for their $5,000 copies of the Durango console by assembling and selling it using store-bought parts. A complaint and allegations circulated among the group that the FBI had confiscated the console and was searching for hackers resulting from one of the Durangos never showing up at the customer's place. Then Wheeler placed an eBay offer for the fictitious Xbox system, motivated by his ambition to become the world's most renowned Xbox hacker. Before eBay stopped the sale and declared it fraudulent, the big hit was $20,000. 
Prokhorov severed relations with Wheeler because he was so enraged that he was generating a lot of media attention. The gang became more anxious as a result of numerous members going missing over the course of the following several weeks, reports that the FBI was searching for them, and concerns that there was a mole among them. David is concentrating on his Xbox cheat service Horizon. Their differences over their Call of Duty services led to their breakup. After that, Clark started to sell virtual money for FIFA on the underground market. Wheeler continued to work alone even after he got involved in the eBay auction. The FBI raided Santa Day Nashawatt's New Jersey residence at the end of 2012. He went crazy trying to hire a hit guy to assassinate the judge who signed the warrant after posting it online. With Edward McAndrew serving as the chief investigator, U.S. federal prosecutors launched a case against the hacking gang in the wake of the 2011 Gears of War breach. Because of Wheeler's risky behavior, they had to move quickly. In February 2013, they raided Wheeler's Perth house and took all of his hard drives and equipment, but they did not make an arrest. Edward McAndrew indicted Pecora, Nashawat, and LaRue on charges of wire fraud, identity theft, and conspiracy to steal trade secrets in 2013. The indictment was sealed. The evidence used in the case came from an informant known only as Person A. Numerous sources identify Person A as Justin May, who remained silent when asked if he was an insider. He was on trial at the time for allegedly robbing Cisco and Microsoft of equipment valued at millions of dollars. The relationship between Pecora and Clark soured when Pecora began hacking game developers. They eventually quarreled over personnel issues in their Call of Duty services business. For example, Pecora considered some of the workers to be greedy, but Clark refused to fire them. Tired of the quarrels, the entrepreneurs separated. Pecora focused on Horizon, an Xbox cheat service he created on the side with some friends. He liked that Horizon cheats could not be used on Xbox Live, which created fewer potential technical and legal problems. Meanwhile, Clark improved FIFA's coin generation technology and began selling virtual currency on the black market. Austin Alcala, who was involved in the Zombie Studios hack and Xbox One counterfeit, worked at Clark's new venture. With 20-year-old Pecora's powers now split between Horizon and attending university, Wheeler continued the kamikaze path alone. After his eBay stunt, Microsoft sent a private investigator named Miles Hawks to Perth. Wheeler tweeted about meeting Mr. Microsoft Man, who pressed him for information about his accomplices over lunch at the Hyatt. According to Wheeler, Hawks said not to worry about legal consequences because Microsoft was only interested in going after the real hackers, but Microsoft denied saying this. In December 2012, the FBI raided the home of Sanadoda Neshawat in New Jersey. He posted the unredacted search warrant online. Wheeler responded by doxing the agents in public forums, encouraging people to harass them. He also openly talked about hiring a hitman to kill the federal judge who signed the warrant. Wheeler's strange, impulsive attempts to escalate any situation have alarmed federal prosecutors, who have been carefully building a case against the hackers since the Gears of War leak in June 2011. Edward McAndrew, the assistant U.S. attorney leading the investigation, felt the need to quicken the pace of his team's work before Wheeler got to the point of actual violence. On the morning of February 19, 2013, Wheeler was working at his family home in Perth when he heard a noise in the yard outside his window. A group of men in light tactical gear with glocks at their sides was approaching the house. Wheeler began to quickly turn off all the computers so that the forensic scientists would at least have to work on cracking the passwords. Over the next few hours, Wheeler estimates Australian police took away $20,000 worth of computer equipment. The guy was dumbfounded that no one bothered to put his precious hard drives in anti-static bags. He was not arrested that day, but a ton of evidence was found on his discs. Wheeler often took screenshots of his hacking exploits, including a chat in which he suggested running some kind of crazy program on the Zombie Studios server to explode the interest of fans. That July, Pecora told Justin May that he was going to attend DEF CON, the annual hacker gathering in Las Vegas, his first trip to the United States in years. 
On July 23rd, McAndrew and colleagues filed a sealed 16-count indictment against Pecora, Neshawat, and LaRue, accusing them of crimes including wire fraud, identity fraud, and conspiracy to commit theft, trade secret. Wheeler and Gamer Freak, the original source of the Epic Password list, are listed as co-conspirators. Alcala would be added four months later. The documents showed that much of the case was built on evidence from an informant called Person A. He's described as a Delaware man who took a fake Durango from LaRue's house and turned it over to the FBI. Prosecutors also described the defendants as members of a certain Xbox underground community. Wheeler's prison joke was no longer a joke. Unaware of the secret indictment, Pecora canceled his trip to DEF CON at the last minute due to work commitments. FBI agents worried that the arrest of his American accomplices would prompt him to flee, so the agency decided to wait for his trip south before shutting down the remaining hackers. Two months later, Pecora went to the Toronto Opera House for a concert by the Swedish metal band Catatonia. His phone buzzed with the first screams from the stage. It was Alcala, now a senior at Fisher's Indiana. He was gushing with delight. He said he knew a guy who could get both of the latest Durango prototypes, real ones, not copies, as they did in the summer. An acquaintance of his is ready to break into the Microsoft campus building in Redmond to steal them. In exchange, the hacker demanded credentials to log into the Microsoft Game Developer Network, plus several thousand dollars. Pecora was puzzled by the audacity of the novice robber. This guy is stupid, he thought. But after many years of successful adventures, Pecora lost the habit of listening to common sense. He told Alcala to keep him posted. Armin, also referred to as Armin the Cyber, is an 18-year-old high school graduate who consented to tell his story under the condition that his last name not be revealed. A year earlier, he cloned a Microsoft employee badge that belonged to his mother's boyfriend. Since then, he's repeatedly used the RFID card to explore the Redmond campus, passing as an employee and dressing head to toe in Microsoft swag. Microsoft says the guy didn't copy the badge, but rather stole it. Armand has already taken out one Durango for personal use. He was afraid to return for another, but he was also filled with the recklessness of youth. After an appearance in federal court in Buffalo and several days in a nearby county jail, Pecora was loaded into a van with another federal inmate, a gang member with the arms of a power lifter and no discernible neck. They were transported to a private prison in Ohio, where Pecora will be held until the court in Delaware begins proceedings. According to him, the guards threw sandwiches to the prisoners on the floor of the van, knowing that the tightly shackled prisoners could not bend down and take them. A gang member doing time for hitting a guy with a hammer told Pecora during the three-hour ride that he should try to spend as little time in prison as possible, saying, this life is not for you. Honestly, no one is meant for this life. Pecora took the words to heart when he was flown to Delaware in early 2014. He quickly accepted the proposed plea deal and helped the affected companies identify the vulnerabilities he had exploited, such as weakly protected tunnels through which he entered their networks. Listening to Pecora's professorial explanation of his hacks, Chief Prosecutor McAndrew now spoke flatteringly of the 22-year-old Canadian. He's a very talented guy who went down a bad path, he said. Often when investigating these things, you can't help but admire a certain level of brilliance and creativity. This is where you step back and say this is where everything went wrong. One day on the way from prison to court, Pecora was put in a marshal's car with someone who seemed familiar. A pale, thin 20-year-old guy with teeth accustomed to sweets. It was Nathan LaRue, whom Pecora had never met in person but recognized from a photograph. He was arrested on March 31st in Madison, Wisconsin, where he had moved after the FBI raid. That raid scared him enough to abandon the Xbox stage and go into hiding. He was thriving in his new life as a programmer at Human Head Studios, a small game studio, when the feds showed up and took him into custody. Under Pecora, LaRue was released on bail and allowed to live with his parents while the case was being considered. But raised in Maryland, he was convinced with his diminutive stature and shyness, he was simply doomed to be raped or killed in prison. Fear took over him so much that on June 16th, 
The guy cut off the police bug on his ankle and ran away. He paid a friend to take him to Canada, 600 kilometers north. But the long trip ended in failure. The Canadians called their car at the border. Instead of accepting failure, LaRue pulled out a knife and tried to cross the bridge onto Canadian soil. As officers surrounded him, he decided he only had one option left and stabbed himself several times. Doctors at an Ontario hospital managed to save the guy's life. Once he was released from intensive care and transported back to Buffalo, authorities revoked his bail. When it came time for Pecora's sentencing, the lawyer asked for leniency on the grounds that his client had lost the ability to distinguish between a game and a crime. After pleading guilty, Pecora, LaRue, and Neshawat ultimately received similar sentences. 18 months in prison for Pecora and Neshawat, and 24 months for LaRue. Pecora spent most of his time at the Federal Detention Center in Philadelphia, where he sat in the computer room reading email and listening to MP3s. One day, while waiting for the console to open, a mentally unstable prisoner hit him in the face, and Pecora fought back so as not to look like a weakling. The fight ended when a security guard sprayed pepper spray. After completing his prison sentence, Pecora spent several months awaiting deportation to Canada in an immigration detention facility in Newark, New Jersey. There were also PCs in the library, and Pecora had to use a little hacking skills to launch the hidden Microsoft Solitaire, which is prohibited from launching by default. When he finally returned to Mississauga in October 2015, he wrote to old friend Anthony Clark, who was now facing justice. Alcala told authorities all about Clark's coin mining scam. The company had already been on the tax authorities' notice. One of the employees came under suspicion after withdrawing $30,000 from a bank account in Dallas in one day. Alcala helped the feds put the pieces of the puzzle together. He explained that the system uses electronic arts servers to generate thousands of coins per second. The software code automated and accelerated FIFA gameplay by more than 11,500 times. Thanks to this information, it was possible to charge Clark and three accomplices with wire fraud. They allegedly made $16 million by selling FIFA coins primarily to a Chinese businessman, whom they only knew as Tao. All three of Clark's accomplices pleaded guilty, but he planned to defend himself in court. The hacker believed that he had done nothing wrong because Electronic Arts Terms of Service stated that FIFA coins had no real value. Besides, if the executives at Electronic Arts are dissatisfied with his activities, why didn't they discuss the issue like adults? Perhaps Electronic Arts was simply jealous that he, and not them, had found a way to generate income from in-game currencies. Clark's hearing in Federal District Court in Fort Worth in November didn't go as he had hoped. He was convicted of conspiracy to commit wire fraud. His lawyers believed that he had excellent grounds for appeal because the prosecution had failed to prove that Electronic Arts' business had suffered any actual harm. But Clark's legal team never got that chance to pursue the case. On February 16, 2017, about a month before his scheduled incarceration, Clark died at his home. Relatives claimed the death was accidental as a result of a lethal interaction between alcohol and medications. Clark had just turned 27 and left an estate worth more than $4 million. As we wrap up this story of the Xbox Underground, it's like closing the last chapter of an incredible book. These hackers explore the digital world in ways that sometimes worried people and sometimes shocked them, much like modern day explorers. They may have been controversial in their actions, but they did make an impression. Everyone is now aware of how crucial it is to protect our digital information thanks to the Xbox Underground. Their tricks made it more difficult for hackers to get access by encouraging businesses to upgrade their security protocols. We may learn from their narrative that the digital world isn't as secure as we may believe. It's similar to a large puzzle, and skilled hackers such as the Xbox Underground have shown how simple it may be to solve. As we say goodbye to them, it's important to keep in mind that the Xbox Underground story is more complicated than just stealing and hacking. It also has to do with the responsibility that comes with the power of technology. They forced us to rethink how we manage and protect our digital data. So let's take a moment to be appreciative of the insight we've gained from their experiences. 
So let's be cautious and responsible in the digital world, whether we're using a computer or enjoying video games. Who knows? Perhaps one day we'll solve the mystery of what actually happened with the Xbox Underground. Their tale will captivate us and encourage us to learn more about the constantly changing field of technology up until that point. If you liked this video, don't forget to like, comment, and share this video. Also, make sure you hit that bell icon and subscribe to our channel for more.